everybody's got different, you know, risk tolerances and different aspects that different places they're at in their life. So we, we always recommend that people speak with an advisor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to play dumb here a little bit. I mean, when's the last time a new asset class came along and an advisor had to talk to somebody about it? 150 years ago. <laughs> Oil. Right, right. <laughs> Welcome to the Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Guiding you to financial freedom today are my two co-hosts, Robert Swarthout, founder and CEO, portfolio manager at Teton Crypto Capital, and Don Freeman, Back again, president of DAC-FP, which is Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals. And uh, guys, we have a lot to cover because it's been a little while since we dropped a crypto edition of um, A Wiser Retirement, and a lot has happened. Were you were you here before uh, SBF went to jail, or is that after? Well, I, I was here before he went to jail, but I was here. But the news after. had already broke. Yeah, so I actually did a little research. So when I was here, which was in April, Bitcoin was at twenty eight thousand. Okay, and now fast forward to today, Bitcoin is at roughly thirty eight thousand. So you're looking at a thirty five percent. So we should thank return. you. Return. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Yeah, happy to help <laughs> any way I can. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh robert how's the how's the fun going going good you know it's it helps when things are up um you know i've started really thinking about like what this next bull market might look like um it seems like it's going to be largely still fomo driven um not much utility there's some utility but nothing of consequence so just trying to understand how you might handle um trading in and out of a position and just you know going back and really modeling like what the last cycles or previous cycles have looked like to kind of, you know, and your, your fun focus is really more, it's not the, the stuff that everyone's reading about every day. It's, it's more the industrial usage of yeah. Yeah. Commercial use cases. So it's, you know, trade finance, supply chain management, um, you know, cross border payments, crypto with crypto with a purpose, <laughs> crypto with a purpose. That's a great way to say it. You know, there's certainly been some of, you know, of the 16 things that the fund holds, I think three or four of them have had trials or real world use cases this year. A lot of things are being worked on and it's, it's just slow, you know, when you're building, you know, building a new industry, it's, you know, a lot of, you know, pipes need to be laid. So, yeah. Well, today I want to focus about, um, all these spot ETF applications that have been, that have been uh, applied for, everyone seems to think that there's going to be a Bitcoin ETF soon because BlackRock applied. They did. <laughs> and if yes. BlackRock applied, <laughs> there's something like what, 574 times they've applied and they've got it 573 times. Yes, like, yeah. They, 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 get, lost they get it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they don't maybe necessarily get it immediately. Um, that, and I think that's really probably what the discussion's about is, you know, uh, it's coming, but like maybe when is it coming? I mean, a lot of folks have their eyes on January 10th because mm -hmm. that's when the SEC has to make a decision on the ARC yes. ETF. So sometime between now and then. But did all this get triggered because of the Grayscale lawsuit? Was that? Well, I mean, there's been kind of three main events. One is, as you said, the BlackRock uh, filing was, was big. The second one was um, how the, the judge came down in the appeal for Grayscale in their favor saying that um, the SEC was arbitrary and capricious. Mm -hmm. And then the third big piece is, as Robert and I were talking about, which is upcoming, is is the, the Bitcoin halving, which is April, May. And for those folks that don't know what that is, mm. as, a, as a miner, you, you validate the transactions. And it's like football fields of computers racing to see who, who wins. And the winner right now, I think, gets six and a half Bitcoin, I think it is. Every block, and I forget a block is every 10 minutes. Yeah. Something like that. And then it gets cut in half in April, May. Yeah. So every roughly every four years, it cuts in half again, and a half again, and a half again. Right. In perpetuity. And, oh, up not, until the year 2140. So basically, yeah. it won't be long or it's six and a quarter, I think. Is that the, It'll validation go to three of and an is that the validation of transactions that you're talking about? 
it's the, it's you're you're validating transactions and you're also basically mining new Bitcoin, right? Like so, basically, they're getting paid less, so they have to mine fat mine faster. Well, it it is an arms race for sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just the thinking is if the miners are going to get half as much for doing the same work, they want to see the price or they re- they demand the price to be higher because they won't sell the stuff that they're mining into the market. Got it. And therefore double the price if you're cutting the reward in half. Okay. Yeah. So that's in the April, May time. So frame. like yeah. purely supply demand. kind of. And that's yeah. the other thing to your point. Exactly. There's limited supply. Yeah. So that also pushes prices up. The other thing is that I don't know how many people are aware of, but since the birth of Bitcoin and again, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. It, it moves in these four-year cycles. So it's three up, one down. So 2022 was the one down, which means the new four-year cycle started 2023, the year that we're in, and it's the best-performing asset class this year. It's up over 100%. So hopefully it does another three up, one down. But again, mm-hmm. past performance is no guarantee. Yeah, it's, you know. Yeah. And it could be a little bit of sideways up, too, for the first couple of those that three years. How do you correlate that? Let's just just throw that to the S and P five hundred. The S and P yeah. five hundred's also been three but, up, one down. Well, right? the way that I think about it is, crypto as a whole has never had to deal with a recession in the stock market. I mean, because it, it was it was birthed in one in two thousand nine ten, yeah, and then the market bit was up for ten years. I mean, yes, there was mostly some, yeah. mostly. So it's like, how is the current political environment coupled with? are we in recession we not whatever it is and then you have this so i don't know it's it's intriguing yeah and within that i'm not an economist or anything but it's the risk on risk off Mm -hmm. i mean you're raising interest rate i mean every everything was down in 2022 Mm -hmm. you know interest rates go up you know is it you know that's that's the risk off and yeah they're saying we're plateauing and if interest rates go down that's another you know bullish sign for something like bitcoin so there's 12 of these applications and a, there's a, I don't know, four or five of them. They're kind of bunched together. Mm-hmm. Um, BlackRock being one of them. They kind of kicked that can to in January a couple of weeks ago where they basically said yeah. it's not happening. Yesterday, the SEC opened the comment period a month early on the Franklin Templeton application, which was interesting because the SEC does nothing early. Um, <laughs> right. So, you know, it, it, it almost feels like they're trying to get all the ducks in line so they can get everybody out the door at the same time. Right. Um, in an, an attempt not to be a kingmaker um, is at least the theory that I've probably subscribed to. Um, when that happens, you know, we'll see. But January the 10th is the date that. So if they achieve, I mean, I have a list of BlackRock, Wisdom Tree, pl- people I never even heard of. Um, well, Arc, well, we all heard of Arc, but yeah. Van Eck, Fidelity. Um, Bitwise. Global yeah, X. Global Franklin X. Templeton. Uh, Who's hashtags? Who's uh, Valkyrie? Yeah, Valkyrie so, Investments. Yeah, so we're actually up, upon assuming that at some point there's an approval. We actually have lined up. We're interviewing Rick is interviewing six of the twelve, which will be pretty cool because he's basically going to go right into the studio and interview those six, and then we're going to release them once a day because he has a podcast, a daily podcast. So each one will be interviewed for 15 minutes. So that'll be, we're super excited about that. That'll be pretty cool. And where is that show? So our sister company is called The, the Truth About Your Future. So the, T-A-Y-F dot com. And he does a, a Monday through Friday podcast. Monday through Thursdays, three to 10 minutes, focuses on longevity, health and retirement, um, retirement security, exponential technologies and blockchain digital assets. So when this happens he's going to dedicate we'll have six days because right now we have six of the right. uh, applicants who want to be on this interview and we'll do a 15 minute interview with each one of them so is larry fink one of them uh i i'm, I'm not sure if i'm allowed to say which oh. who, who the six are you'll have to tune in yeah uh, <laughs> that would be a very that would be a rock star interview yeah because larry fink basically said it it was a uh, Bitcoin was an was an index to money laundering, but well, then he, and then he followed it up with Bitcoin is the future effectively exactly. <laughs> so right. he's, he sees the light. He, he's using the Jamie Dimon playbook when it comes to crypto. <laughs> right, talk bad about it, do, and then you, all of a sudden you like it the next day. Talk bad about it, put do everyone out of business. Millions and millions of dollars in bond <laughs> transactions. <laughs> yes, all right. 
(laughs) Interesting. So, all right. So this gets approved. I mean, Don, you work with lots of financial advisors. How many are telling you, I'm staying on the sidelines until the ETF's approved, then we're in? Right. So we actually have statistics on that because we've done surveys. So presently, 12% of advisors are recommending Bitcoin to clients. Currently. Currently, yes. In the event that a a spot Bitcoin ETF does get approved, 77% are going to say that they're going to recommend this spot Bitcoin ETF to their clients. So probably at the 1% rate that everyone talks about. So that gets to the next thing is people are asking like, how does that, you know, how do you think that impacts flows? So Rick is a believer in a 1% allocation. There's folks out there that are anywhere between one and 3%. So if you just take the RIA world, which manages $8 trillion in in client assets, 77% of them recommend it at a 2% allocation. That's $150 billion in flows. That's mm. what we feel the potential is, you know, over the next, you know, I don't know, two, three, four years. But that's a that's a pretty significant number. So I want to get technical here for a second. I mean, I grew up with you in, in the ETF yeah, launch, yeah. launching, right? So uh-huh. the first thing I go to is if you have 12, let's say six get approved. You have six ETFs all buying bitcoin you're gonna you would have to have a nasty uh spread at that beginning of the opening of those trades i would think because they're all actually buying bitcoin correct yes they have to physically own it and settle it It, it's not paper bitcoin yeah it's real bitcoin yeah so who's who's going to be the ap behind that is going to be different ap's these are your authorized participants. These yeah, yeah, no, who, I know what you're Well, the listeners may not know. Uh, <laughs> but but basically, you know, you, you buy something, you have the ETF company has to have someone else basically help fulfill and create the ETF wrapper. Right. right. Creation redemption. Correct. So in this world, it's not like a, a knight or anybody like that. It's like, who was it for with a BlackRock? Um, uh, BNY, is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, BNY Mellon. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, if I'm understanding your question correctly, there's certainly, I, would, I guess I call them rumors, that many of these players have already been accumulating. So they have the Bitcoin to sell. Uh, I mean, it's a bit of a trade for them, right? Like That's true. Um, and BlackRock could buy that. and Yeah. yeah you would no never problem. know. Yeah. Um, and, there, and, you know, lately there's been more... Um, on what's to be anonymous on chain stuff happening with Bitcoin with the accumulation of wallets that are of size. Like there's one wallet that is now holding seven percent of Bitcoin. They have no idea who it is. It, a month ago it had zero. Wow. So you know I think that probably BlackRock because they know exactly when this stuff's gonna get approved. They're all in the White House. All these guys Correct. are in the White House. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, it's not like all all these you know these twelve different applications are opening their Coinbase account and buying. Um, Bitcoin off of Coinbase. You think that's part of the application process to say we have X amount to be able to create a stable, a stable. Well, they ETF? provide their custodians. They, the custodian. I mean, if, if it wasn't part of the application, that would be public, wouldn't it be? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. And I'm sure that would be making the news. Yeah. Because there's no news that I've seen that says BlackRock or, you know, whatever applicant says they own Bitcoin currently. I just see it as, I think a lot of people <clears throat> will be buying this. And I just wonder how orderly the initial week one is going to be. That's that, that's just very interesting to me. Crypto is typically not orderly. I mean, it, it's it it could it's drastic in both directions. Yeah, like w- when when there's actual like liquidity. But that's also the pur- purpose of the AP is to make it an orderly market and keep spreads very very narrow. Would make, which would make sense on why you'd have to be accumulating it ahead of time. Mm-hmm with anticipation of what demand could be. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just, you, you know, it, and, and, and we can talk about, well, I'll shift the, I'll shift gears just a minute. It, just because there's an sec sanctioned ETF to buy spot coin or buy a Bitcoin mm-hmm. through a spot ETF. How does that change regulation? Well, it doesn't change regulation. I mean, is crypto still kind of like the wild, wild west in that, well, we don't have official crypto regulation in the United States right now, even though we have an e- we could have an ETF next year. So, a couple things here: um, the law, of the land, 
according to the courts, XRP is not a security. Bitcoin has never been tried, but it's basically decided it. You know, everyone they left it agrees. alone. They left it alone. There's largely because there's no one to go sue in Bitcoin, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, just genius, um, right? <laughs> so you know that that's a commodity. I mean, that's it's easy. Um, at least under current definitions, you know, yeah. if we got regulations, they redefine what it is, maybe it becomes a, something that's crypto related. But, you know, r- the regulation is still murky. I mean, the for the foreseeable future, the courts are the path to any sort of clarity. And that's going to be one offs, uh, expensive and slow. I was about to say, and you can probably win it, but it's going to cost you 200 plus million as we've already seen. Yeah. In, in three years. Yeah. So and most people don't have that much patience or time. Or, I mean, patience or money. But so, maybe the safer bet here is the fact that it's Bitcoin and we're talking about, and we're not trying to put Dogecoin into an ETF. Right. The, <laughs> the other thing, though, is once it's approved by the SEC, then the, the ETF is a security. Correct. And it can be in the, the largest place that people uh, have money is in their 401ks and their retirement accounts. So, it could obviously mm-hmm. be in, in your brokerage account, but also in a 401k. So, that's why it's being looked upon as is like the holy grail that once it's blessed by the sec then um it's game on and then you have uh the wirehouses who will take a look at it and once it hits 100 million which is usually their benchmark yeah they usually go 100 million three-year uh track record but i think in this case it's going to be 100 million and now suddenly it's available on the the morgan stanley's and and Right. Uh, the other it should be a hundred million over Merrill Lynch. And, right. Oh, easily. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but what I'm well, saying is like, well, it's per product. So for example, true. if it's the bitwise one, if it accumulates a yeah. hundred million, that one will be able to go on the platform. Yeah. If it's one that has 5 million, 10 million, that's not going to make it onto the platform. No, no. So I, I, I yeah. Like a Van Eck. Yeah. Invesco. Those are companies that typically have smaller. We'll holes, see. So, yeah. It's also, you know, there's also a couple um, ETF issuers who have applied for Ethereum ETFs. So yes. Correct. Bitcoin is just the... Black is, the on- is one of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's just the on-ramp. I mean, this this is, this is could open up into lots of different coins. And, you know, there's also picks and shovels ETFs that are out there right now. Mm-hmm. So this is just the beginning. Yeah, the, the Ethereum ones I find intriguing because the SEC has been very clear that they're not willing to say it's not a security. But they won't say what it is. Right. But the same organization that you're filing with to get an ETF. So it's, yeah. that one, I, I'm not going to say BlackRock's going to lose that one. I think that one will take some time. Right. Um, it, it intrigues me that BlackRock went that route because they know they likely could get clarity with an XRP one. Yeah. Or get a good clarity. They could get that approved because the courts have said that even though the SEC doesn't like that decision because they lost. I don't know. It's just some um, interesting world we live in with this SEC when it comes to crypto. So what do you tell someone who thinks, oh, this Bitcoin stuff, I don't understand it. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, I can't pay, I don't understand the purpose of it. I mean, you're going to get pushback from a lot of clients. There's no way that there's financial advisors that are do, just throwing this into a portfolio without a conversation with a client. So there's a couple answers. Um, one, uh, to, to tout ourselves, we have an online self-study course, um, which is a, you get certified in blockchain and digital assets. So it's a phenomenal way to get educated on the space and it's five different tracks. So it's designed from anybody from a financial advisor to a crypto industry person to, we have a consumer track. We also have an X U S track. So whether you're an advisor or a consumer, I think to your point, you got to get educated on this. It's super important to, to know what you're investing in. We obviously encourage people to use financial advisors, um, I mean, that's your fiduciary and, and they should be looking out for everything that you're invested in and in your whole life, life insurance, et cetera. Yeah. So we would, we would encourage people to, to take the course. You can, you could literally get through it in a weekend if you wanted to. Okay. Um, we'll put that in our links. Have yeah. The other thing is if you believe in modern portfolio theory, uh, you believe in a diversified portfolio. So having something uncorrelated, which is most of the time the case in Bitcoin, um, actually uh, diminishes the volatility of the overall portfolio and increases the likelihood of long-term positive results. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you guys have already done this, I know. But when 
<laughs> when I was trying to, I was showing our, our asset manager here, I was like, you know, if you used 1%, right. In it, at the time we did this, people were talking about going to 400,000. Now people are talking about it going to a million. Right. Mm -hmm. But be very you, clear. Kathy's saying that <laughs> true <laughs> at arc. Yeah. Um, but if it went to 400,000, man, you add so much rate of return to the portfolio, even with 1%. But if it goes to zero, it doesn't really affect you that much. Yeah. And so that, that is, that is a very safe number. I think three to 5%. I saw someone say five to 10 recently on a Kitsy's podcast. Yeah. And I was like, Ooh. <laughs> and Rick, yeah. Rick does a, he's done presentations where he takes, if you had a hundred dollars over a 10 year period with an average annualized return of 7%, 60, 40 portfolio, he shows what happens to the 60, 40 portfolio with a annualized 7% return yeah. versus, um, a one, two and 3% allocation to Bitcoin and have it come out of the equity sleeve. So you're at 59, 41, yeah. 40 and one, not 41. <laughs> right. And he shows what happens if Bitcoin goes to zero versus on the upside, if it goes as high as Kathy Wood's prediction of a million. And it's, it's super interesting. It's like mm -hmm. de minimis. It's nothing like if, if it goes to zero and you can see the outsized returns, <clears throat> excuse yeah. me, if it, if it goes that high, we're actually, we're in process of updating that and creating an infographic on our website, which shows how the actual performance has been. And you'll be able to see that. That's cool. Yeah. You know, lately when I've been talking to people, like I don't even talk about price. It's, it's purely like, you know, they're asked, why would I buy Bitcoin? Why would I buy crypto? I'm like, okay, let's rewind. You're, it's 1995. No one knows what the internet's good for. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a bunch of chat rooms. <laughs> right. Um, if you wanted to you say, got mail. you're right, exactly. <laughs> and the disc, you just get a disc every day in the mail. Um, you know, I was like, I used, so I used that analogy and I'm like, you know what? You can do a one or two small allocation. Like if you're not investing in crypto, you're betting against it becoming something. And I was like, at this point, to me, that's a foregone conclusion. It is going to be something, but obviously I'm yeah. convicted about it. Yeah you know, you just got to choose what side of the fence you want to be on there. So an overlay a chart of the first 10 years of Bitcoin versus Amazon. It's like eerily similar. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, look, and look at something as recent as 2022, like all the markets got smacked. Yeah. I don't think advisors were saying, you know, run for the Hills, get out of uh, NASDAQ or get out <laughs> of the S and P 500. It's, it's the right. same thing. Dollar cost average rebalance. That's the name of the game. Yeah, I think most of the podcasts um, that I've listened to, advisors who are definitely on the forefront of this, has has been people already have cryptos, and they're coming to the advisor going, well, "What do I do with these cryptos?" And so the advisors are able to capture those inside, um, like even like Orion, they can sync it into their portfolio mm -hmm. where they see it on the on the sheet just like they would anything else. Mm. It's and, more right, than that. Like we, and then they can they can have their trading strategy if they want, but a lot of them just seem to be at least holding the asset. Yeah, I mean, it's more than that. We do a whole presentation on how to grow your practice by hating Bitcoin. So 22% of Americans <laughs> own Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Hot wallet, cold wallet. What exchange did you buy it on? How did you register it? Is yeah. it in your will? Yeah. Like that all of these thing. questions yeah. that like has nothing to do with recommending it. Yeah. You know, you know it's in your will or, you know, I was talking with um, a good friend yesterday about crypto and, it was saying how the courts haven't really had to deal with crypto in like divorces or like we cover it. I mean, it's, there's a lot of stuff to be figured out that, you know, just, you know, regulations would help if yeah. Congress actually did their job. We, we have a whole thing in our course about like exactly that divorce. People used to, you know, hide gold and diamonds. Mm -hmm. Now they're hiding crypto, crypto and like yeah. language that you should have in your will and stuff and, and, and uh, addressing it as it relates to divorce all in our course. That's great. So we launch an ETF. Um, do you think advisors just start throwing it into the portfolio or do you think it's a conversation that you have to have with clients before you put 1% into a Bitcoin ETF? Cause it's fiduciaries with discretionary authority. Right. Technically. Right. I, I'm not an advisor, but we, <clears throat> we suggest that an advisor talk to their yeah, clients. People need to opt in. Everybody's got different, you know, risk tolerances and different aspects that different places they're at in their life. So we, we always recommend that people speak with an advisor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
I'm going to play dumb here a little bit. I mean, when's the last time a new asset class came along and an advisor had to talk to somebody about it? 150 years ago. <laughs> Oil. Right. right. <laughs> so, so, so I don't think anyone is rehearsed in this. Yeah. Um, so conversations, yeah. you know, communications always. But although, yeah. again, in our course, we talk about co- overcoming the most common client objections. So, Which are what? You got to take the course. <laughs> <laughs> Are you curious why annuities keep coming up as a potential investment option? People are often told that annuities can effectively mitigate investment risks and help secure their financial future. However, annuities often benefit the salesperson and might not be the best choice for you as a consumer. To learn more about the various types of annuities, the negatives of owning them, and better investment alternatives, we have a free ebook on our website just for you. To download our ebook, Buyer Beware, Why Do They Keep Trying to Sell You That Annuity? Simply click the link in the episode notes or visit wiserinvestor.com slash guides. Now let's get back to the episode. I, it has to be lack of understanding of, of yeah. just what I mean, there's a lot of things. Is, I think there's like 15 in total that we have in it. <laughs> you know, it's, um, you know, I often find that people are curious They've heard about it, you know, at a minimum, but they're like, oh, you know, that's way too complex for me. And I'm like, you don't have to understand how Ford makes vehicles. You don't have to understand how Amazon ships packages right. to own something. So it's just, you know, it's, can, it's the fear can, of the technology. They can, they can touch it, though. They can see sure. it. They can understand what the purpose of it is. That That's the hard part that people have with it is yeah. Like, well, what, what's it for? What does it do? Is, is it, you know, some people think that it's, it's like a doomsday thing. Oh yeah. If the world collapse, uh, I have this Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, as long as the internet is still working. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we say it's, it's, it's just software. And from an advisor perspective, the beauty of it is there's so few advisors that are educated on it, that it's a phenomenal marketing opportunity for an advisor. If you're able to talk about it, right. It's a differentiator, which will, increase the likelihood of, of um, gaining new clients and growing assets. There's also a stat that says 62% of clients would leave their advisor for another advisor who, who could talk about it and understand it. Yeah. So. I'm going to ask you a question. What, when you talk to clients, like how often do you have to talk them out of crypto right now? None. Because yeah. are most of your clients 50 plus? Yeah, uh, the average age is 58. Yeah. But our mandate is to maintain a lifestyle. Because mm-hmm. people don't come here to get rich overnight. Yeah. They don't come here to build their businesses. They're bu- usually liquidating businesses or transitioning businesses and they're like, you know, they want to have two homes and a and a uh the kids taken care of and good estate planning done and mm-hmm. if they exactly miss out right. on a 30, 40% rate of return on a 1% allocation right. doesn't really, doesn't really affect them. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's the younger people that I see that have, they do something on the side. Oh, I have this Coinbase account. It's it was 10,000. Now it's two. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. we, we look at it as it should just be part of the annual review. How much cash reserves do you have? What life yeah. insurance do you have? Who the beneficiary is? Which, who's the carrier? Right. Do you own real estate? Yep. Um, do you own crypto? Mm-hmm. Yep. Correct. It's right. Um, and most of our clients do not because again, I think it's, they don't understand what the purpose is. And again, how does it make things better for them by owning it? Yeah. And, and that comes down to, Hey, we have an opportunity to really keep up with inflation. If this thing works out well, right. By having a small allocation here. And so that I, I, I see, I see both sides of it. I'm, I'm not sitting in a meeting right now going, have you considered crypto inside your portfolio? Mm-hmm. Now, if they come in and say, hey, I'd like to do this crypto thing, or I'm looking for something crazy to invest in with like $100,000, then I'd send them to Robert. I'd go, hey, go see Robert. <laughs> Robert's got a fund. You know, I don't get a cut of it. It's, it's between you and him. And uh, drop some money in, and, and, and he'll, he'll uh, do his, run his magic, and uh, you'll have a million dollars. I mean, I go back to modern portfolio theory again. If you believe in a diversified portfolio, there's things within the portfolio that you don't like. Right. That's just part of the, the theory. No, and, that's very true. And that's so, very true. You, it, but first, you have to overcome 
that that this is an asset class and it should be included. Mm-hmm. That's what Spot you have to overcome. ETF. <laughs> well, I mean, that certainly helps the, e- the ETF approval, but also just like the narrative that you hear in the media about like, you know, if, if they're following the news around Congress is thinking about regulation or lack thereof, you know, oddly enough, it, it you know, the, the numbers say that crypto within Congress is not a partisan issue. Exactly. It is yeah. a generational issue. Right. And yep. the people leading these committees and you know leading the different caucuses are on the older side and they just generally don't want to see it move forward but it's actually because it's it actually is a bipartisan yeah. issue it just depends on you know um um what's his name ted cruz wants texas to be the bitcoin capital of the world yeah <laughs> and hates a cbdc and, yeah all right um on the other side elizabeth warren loves a cbdc so she can see what's going on uh, with everybody and hates right. Right. hates bitcoin so they're 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 on different sides of the fence but they they see it yeah and they're very clear on it uh i was just at a conference with and spoke with senator lummis and she's obviously very pro crypto and and um it's great to see that she she points out that more and more congress people are wanting to get educated on the asset class which is which is helpful for all of us mm-hmm. do you think that people inside the government are still consider Bitcoin a threat to the U S dollar in some way. I don't, cause I, cause I, 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 I haven't don't, seen as much of that lately. I don't really see Bitcoin as being a threat to how we transact because it's not really a transact. The debate is, a, has, asset. the debate is more focused on a CBDC versus a stable coin. Right. And which and explain th- CBC, CBDC. Central bank digital currency, which is essentially a, a digital, digital dollar. dollar um, a crypto run by provided, government. Exactly, provided by the government. So I think in the early days, uh, there was more people in favor of CBDC since the, the thing in Canada with the trucker strike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's shifted um, to where a stable coin is more in favor. And a stable coin is really, it's it's not backed or issued by the government. It's It's private organizations, but it's, what's good is because there was a situation before with the algorithmic stable coins which crashed and burned as they should have stable coins are backed by u.s treasuries and so they are essentially um made whole or guaranteed you know with u.s government issued products like treasuries if you want to see a good business become a stable coin provider that's right make some serious money yeah particularly with interest rates at five and a half percent because they get all the interest yeah Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, your eyes just lit up. Yeah, well, I was, about, I was just <laughs> like about to say, Apple. why would anybody buy, buy a stable coin when when interest- the stable coin doesn't move the issuer? Oh, right. I know, but why would a consumer purchase a stable coin now when you can buy? Because they're going to stay inside that ecosystem, like Apple okay. or something like that, and yeah. maybe use it to buy things. And, and got it. Now they're capturing well, that because if you're within a stable coin, um, I mean, I think the IRS needs to update this. But if you sell a stable coin into dollars, that's a taxable transaction. Yeah, it probably shouldn't be. Because it, in theory, isn't moving. Right. Um, so you could use a stable coin to buy things. But if you have crypto and you go to the store to buy a coffee, you don't want a taxable transaction so you could buy something <laughs> right. that is taxable. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Which is presently how the, that's how it works. Yeah. So it helps you stay in that universe. You're never going right. to pull out of a that's right out of a Bitcoin and go to your money market at five percent. Those are two different things. Franklin right. Templeton has a, mm-hmm. a a money market now that's tokenized. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Interesting. 300 million in assets or something. Oh, really? I didn't realize I'd gotten that big. I think it's that big, wow. yeah. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> my, sorry, my mind is just is just running 100 miles an hour. It's all it's like, education. It, it's like a whole new world, basically. Mm-hmm. And that's why you should probably have 1%. You, you know, an allocation. You know, if anything, having a small allocation gets you curious because you also want to care about learning it. What, what's happening? You, because you're literally invested. Yeah. Um, it made me makes you kind of do more homework. Right. And in Bitcoin, again, not necessarily for this podcast, but like the giant overall opportunity is, is the blockchain tokenization. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which is a whole episode into itself. Yeah. 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 The the friend I was talking with yesterday, he works at a, um, uh, basically a financial services company here in Atlanta and that, one of their departments is working on figuring out tokenization and how they tokenize their, their, their bond fund, not their bond, 
not bond funds, but they're, they're um, uh, private funds. Um, and just like private equity, private um, equity type stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, you know what, you know, you think you understand it. Then all of a sudden we get regulations and it throws, it could throw it for a loop. Mm-hmm. Um, in theory, you kind of model it after, but I was kind of back, went to the court thing with him and it was like, if somebody ends up in court and they have a tokenized fund, like how's the court going to deal with that? Like <laughs> the court, the, first of all, you got to find a judge that understands, understands it. Understands it. Yeah. Um, so there's this, you know, we're super early. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there's going to be bumps on the road and you know, obviously there's, there's risk here, but you know, I believe you're getting paid for the risk. So, yeah, for sure. Well, <clears throat> it's going to be interesting to see. Um, like I said, I, I've, um, I, I have not met personally with advisors that are building out digital asset portfolios. Um, like I said, the only ones I've, I've talked with are more West coast based, um, or not talked with, but heard about, or more West coast based through Michael Kitsies and his podcast. But, um, it, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely coming. I just have a hard time. I was, I was trying to explain it to somebody recently. I said, you know, the ETFs, I had no problem being first. <laughs> like in 2004, we had all ETF portfolios. I said, in this case, it's, I'm a little more hesitant to be first. And I don't know it's because if it's like the new world or, well, you know, but you're not it, first. But it, That's part of the argument. The part of the argument of buying it now is, Get in front of the wave. Ride the wave. Yeah. When it gets a, think of this as like the current state is like VC or private equity. Right. And then those companies go public, and those people are either getting out or they're majorly riding the wave. True. It's the same sort of this thought is, process. This is potentially the the first time in at least modern history where an average consumer has the ability to front run a trade against <laughs> large that's organizations. That's very true. Well, that's exactly. And that's, yeah. we look at it very similarly in the sense of um, democratization, democratization in where this is like the, the regular investors opportunity to kind of get private equity mm-hmm. access yeah. presently. Now, when the spot Bitcoin ETF ultimately, hopefully is approved, all that obviously changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then hopefully you're riding the wave. Well, even then, I mean, there's going to be a lot of retail investors, certainly on the spot, on the mm-hmm. spot ETF. Uh, I go back to, you know, <laughs> we we had a person pass through here recently that had all their, 100% of their investments, which was a sizable amount, in um, leveraged uh, QQQ. So 3X QQQ. Wow. For the last <laughs> 10 years. Whoa. Did, uh, did pretty well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you're, if you're well, their fiduciary. Until but they didn't sell. Well, even, yeah. But even 2022 is still sitting on tri- yeah. uh, six-digit gains <clears throat> in, after. But does that work? I thought it's a day trade after that. It starts it is, working against it's, you. When you, when you back test it, it is so weird. Like, you, you just, you're like, wait, what? It's like, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. It's like a daily, it's supposed to be a daily reset, yes, right? Correct. But but it actually worked out. If if he had done like the S and P or whatever, it wouldn't have. It was uh-huh. just because the volatility of of the Nasdaq. I just it's luck. Is mm-hmm. honestly what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. It's just luck. Wow. Um. But but he had no idea. He's like, I just bought this thing. And it's just done really well. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, so it kind of goes back to I feel like the same way with you have to understand what you're buying. And so I'd say anybody's listening who's thinking about, oh, I'll buy that when it comes out. You need to understand what Bitcoin is. Go here, mm-hmm. go go here to DAC FP, take the course. That's right. Understand what's happening because you just don't want to get lucky. <laughs> you want to have some education behind the strategy mm-hmm. and what is it you're you're doing. I, I remember Don walking around your conference. Uh, it was called the Inside ETFs sure. uh, back in the day. I think the year was 2009. And people were like, I don't understand. I bought this, I bought this, the leverage or this uh, 2X uh, Dow <laughs> ETF. And I should have, it was inversed and the market was down. I should have made money. And I'm walking around going, nobody reads the prospectus. Like you guys get paid to read prospectuses, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, it basically says that it, it resets daily. Yeah. It's also the case. <laughs> yeah. So um, funny story when I was at ETF.com, um, I owned a product called USO, which is an oil ETF. And I, I mean, literally bought the low and like was selling it at the high. And I'm like, 
why am I not making nearly as much money as what's happening in the actual <laughs> in the spot? Actual, yeah. So Matt Hogan, who was our um, global head of editorial, did a blog, um, don't buy USO, buy USL, which goes across the 12-month futures. Yeah. And that much, cl- uh, m- not exactly, but does a much better job of mimicking the, the price of, of uh, spot oil. Because you're not actually buying oil, is exactly. Don's point. <laughs> exactly. And you're, you're buying getting a caught futures in the contract. Role. Exactly. You're getting caught in the role. And there's this whole thing called uh, contango, contango and backwardation. Well, that- <laughs> backwardation is good. <laughs> that is good, it. yes. But, you- um, but it's mainly in <laughs> contango and, and uh, yeah, you got you to gotta get educated is, is the bottom line. Yeah, 100%. Un- you got to understand it or your advisor has to understand it. And I walk around conferences, every conference, uh, not as much as the Schwab one. I met some really smart people um, up in Philly this last few weeks. But um, but yeah, in the past, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, where do these people come from? <laughs> and I remember <laughs> I remember back then when people would look me straight in the eye and say ETFs, no chance, never going to oh, work. No. Mutual funds own the day. Yeah. You're out of your mind. Exactly. And exactly. It's somewhat similar now in the world of uh, not, not as much now, but when I started in 2018 in the crypto space, it, it felt similar where people are looking at you and saying the same thing. And, and I'm hopeful that they're wrong (laughs) again. So use this moment for a little education for myself. So January 10th comes along Mm -hmm. and the SEC says, Gives them a green light. I don't know. It gives them all 12 or whatever. Pick your number. That's not the day that they launch. That's the approval date. And then at some point in the future, they can choose to launch. Yeah. Is it just a whoever can get out the door fastest? So that's part of it. That's, and I, yeah. I, I've, I've heard that those that are, you know, very established, i.e. the Black Rocks of the world, they, they might be able to, to launch the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of that is internal in terms of how quickly they can they can flip the switch. But okay. most importantly, if it's January 10th, on January 11th, you need to be listening to Rick's podcast. Because <laughs> that'll be the first of the yeah. of this <laughs> of half a dozen that we have interviewed. Yeah. Okay, so the 11th, 12th, pick a date, whatever the first, co- there's going to be some volatility. There's That's my point. Right. Is okay. like how well, messy well, is it going to be? Likely volatility. And what, what negative press comes out of that for... Well, for the whole well, process. CNBC yeah. will be running Bitcoin, how to buy Bitcoin ads. All day long. <laughs> right. um, so as an advisor, all of a sudden you, you're in a meeting a week later yeah, and it's still volatile. And somebody was like, please add it to my for- portfolio. What do you say to them? Well, first of all, we have model portfolios and we're not letting clients dictate what's in or not in their <laughs> in their portfolio. So it would have to be something they run on their side. <laughs> it, it would be something they would run on the side unless we have decided that, okay, this has a purpose. It's very different. We need to get, we need to have conversations with people. Then, then it might, you know, it might, I don't think I'd ever do a negative consent kind of an email about sure. it, but say, Hey, we have this alternate portfolio where we take 1% out of your equity. We put 1% into Bitcoin mm-hmm. Um, if you want to opt in on that, let us know. We'll make that change. I don't have, I, I, you know, I, I would consider that, but we don't let clients dictate what, I, what to invest in. And I'm hopeful it That's follows. That's why they hire us. Right, exactly. <laughs> sure, that's fair. I, I'm hopeful it follows a similar path to what happened with ETFs, because if you remember way back when, when ETFs were in their infancy, the knock was exactly to your point. Well, what happens when there's a market correction? Are these things just going to like spreads are going to get super wide and people are going to get picked off and this, that, and the other thing. And then when that ultimately happened, they worked pretty much flawlessly. Actually in the, on the bond ETFs, they, they were setting the price. Exactly. Versus, versus, versus the actual bonds. Themselves. That's right. <laughs> exactly. And hopefully that the same thing happens um, with a spot Bitcoin ETF. Hopefully yeah. It's similar. I, I, there's in ETF world. Um, there's a lot of junk. And there's just a lot of expensive things that have their marketing gimmicks, marketing tools. Um, I'm a big fan of the good old tried and true. Uh, you know, SPY? <laughs> not even SPY uh, because of the, the cash drag, but like VOO, IVV, uh-huh. right? You know, but just your core asset classes. Now, we, we do use, um, uh, for us, this was a huge leap for me several years ago, but we started using COW, C-O-W-Z which is basically we looked at it as okay value is 
overpriced. Um, well, the value funds themselves are underpriced, but dividend strategies are overpriced. Gotcha. So basically, they look at uh, free cash flow. Mm-hmm. So companies that have the most free cash flow get added. It resets every three months. That's an active strategy. Done well. Um, but my, my point is that there's a lot of complexity, and I see that maybe maybe the SEC dials some of that back with after Bitcoin gets a uh, spotty kept gets launched, like mm-hmm. what else are they going to approve? Is, is Dogecoin in three years going to have its own ETF? Ethereum. I, Ethereum. That, would make, that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. In, until the SEC, either we have a different chairman and they kind of clean up their crypto agenda. 2026. Yes. Vote correctly next election. I'll say that right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Purely, the, purely a crypto line. Yes. Are you going to have like one of those charts that tells you who to vote for based on? Um, I, I've, I've thought about being that hard line about it. I, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's just, you know, it, it's an important issue to me. And like, but the, the whole Ethereum thing, like, I'm just not convinced that they're out of the woods yet. Um Oh, you think they'll be sucked back in? I, I, I think that the SEC, I think the SEC has one more lawsuit in it, one more big lawsuit in them, and I think it's against consensus. Okay. And Joe Lubin, and I think Vitalik gets um, wrapped up in it too. Mm-hmm. So the guy that started, I, you know, is do it they a 50-50 two, shot? Do I they have know. $200 million in three years? Um, they Well, they have a lot of Ethereum, so they can, so okay. yes, they have the money. They have the money to defend themselves. Um, so for those who haven't been following, basically in the Ethereum case, they spent over two hundred million dollars yeah. defending themselves. Ultimately, you could say they won. I guess. Yeah, yes. I, but this. But to be clear, this SEC will not be the one that sues um, consensus. I think a Republican administration with a new head is the one that sues them. Interesting, Hester Purse. I yeah. didn't say that. That, that would be the ultimate like <laughs> mic drop for her. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> there's also keep in mind. There's also you you're talking about Bitcoin Ethereum. There's also products like Bitw from Bitwise, which is like the S and P 500 of, of crypto. And, and that's an OTC listed uh, security. So people can buy that right now if they want. Yeah. So there, there's, yeah. and that's on the actual underlying asset, correct? That you're, they, they, they deal with custody. Yeah. yeah it's do, market they, cap weighted. It's primarily uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, but there's eight others in it and yeah. it can be, I think it's, it's, it's market cap weighted, but I think they have the ability to like take something out. So for example, they took out XRP when that whole lawsuit yeah. happened, but uh, then on the appeal, when they, um, when the, when the, the judge ruled, ruled in favor of, of, uh, of XRP yeah. on the yeah. certain issue, I think they put it back in. Interesting. Now, how so. does that set up? Can you buy BITW on any exchange? So, because I, it, I mean, not, I bought it through it's, Schwab. Um, it's not an e- I mean, it's an ETF. It's an OTC listed security. Uh, so um, not true ETF. Right. So it's kind of like buying a, so bond, it has I the uh, um, don't you have to be accredited to premium. buy that one? Nope, no, okay. nope. Anybody but it's only buy. on certain platforms. Like um, I believe it's on Fidelity. It's definitely on Schwab. Uh, I I don't know if it's like I. I don't think it's on like Ameriprise. Didn't or you something. have to used to buy it through? Um, like yes, a it was. Trust. It was a private application, right? Yeah, but now it's an OTC listed yeah. security. Okay. So, question about the Bitcoin ETF. Um, have have any of you looked at the applications and what their fees structure are going to be? I haven't. I think I isn't it like in the uh, fifty to seventy five bips? Yeah, is that? Oh, well, I, I that haven't would be tickets it. in that. That range. would be super competitive because right now BITW is what nearly. No, you're thinking of GBTC, G- which oh, is GBTC, over two right. two yeah. percent. Yeah, it's yeah, definitely yeah. there's going to be fee compression for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you got twelve applicants and even half of them get approved, you'd have to have someone going. Mm-hmm. You all own the same thing. You'd, ha- you'd have to have fee compression, you would think. And that's what's going to be interesting about the interviews that Rick does is how are you going to differentiate yourself? Yeah. Like there's custodians, there's fees. You know, what else is there um, I, I that's think going to differ? It's kind I, of like gold, you know. There's several different, you know, IAU, GLD. There's one from Granite Shares. Um, I, I, I just think, I mean, they're all regulated, but it's kind of like you going to fly Delta Airlines or you're going to fly exactly. in a Cessna 182. People I think, who I think love, I'm taking the Delta yeah. in this case. People who like <laughs> Kathy Woods are going to buy the ARC one. Obviously, a lot of folks are going to buy BlackRock. You've got yeah. BI, uh, Bitwise, Bitwise is like the, the pure crypto player. I mean, right. then you've got Global X, uh, Invesco, Franklin Templeton. I mean, but you know that BlackRock has the, probably fidelity. The, the most ability to lower the price to the lowest point, I would think. Just based off they're so big. 
They could even take a loss yes. to create market share in it if they so, wanted to. So this doesn't exist in the Bitcoin one, but in a future where an e- Ethereum or some other um, uh, crypto is an ETF that is a um, uh, staking-based system, yeah, that's functioning interest. So the question is, will that be passed along, or is that something that the um, sponsor kind of gets to absorb? Well, isn't that like mm-hmm. ETFs today where like they lend out, like that's the dirty little secret on Wall Street? They yeah. like lend it out and make money that way. And I'm not yeah. like an AP know. expert. He lend it out people's Bitcoin. I, I could get nasty. No, no, I'm not yeah. saying that. I'm just saying in the traditional <laughs> world. I, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So in say, say Ethereum gets um, approved at some point, the, I mean, the fees technically could appear to be lower than that, than the Bitcoin one, because there's no quote unquote interest in the Bitcoin one that the sponsor could be receiving. Right. Um, but the in the Ethereum one that that does exist. But so what they staking. could do is maybe if the, maybe the issuer could keep the interest and lower the fee. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So it just be interesting to kind of see how these kind of shake out, you know, over the course of years. Yeah. It'll take. So. Well, I mean, when you when the SPY came out, do you remember? I mean, that was a long time ago. It was 1991, right? But what was the fee? I think. What was the fee? Oh, I don't know. I was probably around half a percent to 0.75% or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I remember when IVV, I think, was around 0.15 or 0.25, which is super dirt cheap at the time. But now it's three bips. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. So love it. The same thing will happen in, in the yeah. crypto world. It'll get cheaper as more players come in. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, Bitcoin's just the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely see that. I definitely see that. And then, you know, you talk with Robert offline and you understand how these different currencies are being used for transactions Absolutely. and how they make things more efficient. I mean, even to be able to transact and not have to use Swift anymore alone, that's, that's, that's worth a lot of money for a lot of people because that's time. It saves days. Right? Yeah, six days at, what, 6.5% versus mm-hmm. 10 minutes at virtually free cross-border. Yeah. Yep. yeah, so there's definitely a lot of uh, purposes Um for the usage. And I think it comes back to, you know, educating people again, which is uh, what you guys are doing good at uh, DAC FP. Uh, Well, guys, we got to wrap it up here, but um, thanks for the conversation today. And uh, if you want to learn more about crypto, we'll have a link for that in our show notes. If you want to learn more about Teton crypto uh, capital, capital, um, you can, uh, I guess we put we should have a link for that in our show notes as well. They can reach out to Robert directly. Thanks for listening. See you guys next time. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hoadley. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.